One of the core concepts of Abrahamic theology, especially in the Christian and Islamic worlds, is that of a war waged between the forces of goodness represented by God and the great angelic army, and those of evil, represented of course by Satan or Iblis and the great demonic horde. Over the centuries, theologians, mystics, and occultists have drawn up incredibly complex hierarchies of such beings, with the names, seals, and tasks, and even their final destiny, detailed in a range of texts, from canonical biblical scriptures, books allegedly revealed by such entities, to texts whose origins remain to this day rather mysterious. The world of angels and demons continues to fascinate, terrify, and inspire billions of believers all over the world. But what do we know about the origin of these entities in the Abrahamic tradition? If we were to rewind the clock back to the ancient Israelites, the progenitors of Jewish, Christian, and Islamic mythologies, among others, what do we know about the earliest stratum of Israelite demonology? In this episode, we're going to do just that, explore the demonological ecology of the ancient Israelite worldview. If you're interested in magic, the academic analysis of the occult and hermetic philosophy, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube, consider supporting my work on Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. As you might imagine, this channel is really only possible with your support. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate your consideration of supporting my work here on this channel. So let's turn to a people at once incredibly popular, and yet at the same time rather mysterious, the ancient Israelites and their demonology. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. The Israelites were among the groups of people of the ancient Levant that we typically call the Canaanites. They come into history with a mention in the Merneptah Steli dating to the early 13th century BCE and go on to great fame as the progenitors of the Abrahamic religions, including Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, among others. Their writings are preserved in inscriptions, letters, and perhaps most famously in the motley collection of texts that we now call the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament. To get a grasp of the demonological landscape of the Israelites, we need to turn to that literature, though with an eye to nearby cultures and writings. Of course, the ancient Israelites didn't exist in a vacuum, and their culture was influenced by and a reaction to their neighbors like any culture. So what do we mean by demon? Well, the term itself has a complicated history, and what we're doing in this episode is a bit anachronistic, just to be honest. That said, for the purposes of this episode, we're going to mean by demon something like malevolent supernatural being. Well, at least malevolent to us human beings, but malevolent. As we'll see, this gets really complicated, but as a provisional definition, it's about the best that we're going to do. What's perhaps most conspicuous about such entities in ancient Israelite religious culture in relationship to their neighbors, and here I'm thinking about the Egyptian and Mesopotamian religious cultures, is just the dearth of such beings. We just don't see much in the way of angels or demons or other kinds of supernatural non-God beings. Ancient Israel just didn't have much in the way of demons or angels, for that matter, until the rise of apocalyptic Judaism in the Persian period. 
Hundreds of demons are known from ancient Egypt, many with really high profile roles in their religious mythology. For instance, Amit is perhaps the most famous. This demon has the lower body of a hippopotamus, the forebody of a lion, and the head of a crocodile, and it eats the souls of those found unjust in the trials of the afterlife. I mean, their name in Egyptian literally means the one that devours the dead, so yeah, they, they eat your soul, and the Egyptians were rightly terrified of them. Over in Mesopotamia, similar beings are also known, though not quite to the degree of proliferation that we find in ancient Egypt. Typically, these beings are the denizens of Kor, or Utsetu in the Semitic Akkadian language, and these would include the torturous Gala demons, along with the most famous of such beings, Pazuzu, king of the demons of the wind, brother of the monster Humbaba of Epic of Gilgamesh fame, the son of the god Hanbi, and possessor of the little girl Regan from The Exorcist. Of similar fame is the demoness Lamashtu, killer of infants and children, who would eventually develop into the demoness Lilith many centuries later. Though, as I mentioned a moment ago, if one were to survey Israelite literature and mythology, which we're kind of doing, the first thing that you would notice is there just aren't many such beings around at all. And when they are mentioned, it's almost always in passing, and there's virtually no mythological filling out or backstories for these beings. From this, we can conclude that the people that composed and redacted Israelite literature or the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament were simply either suppressing such a mythological aspect of their culture, or were simply disinterested in such beings, or that such beings just didn't play that much of a role in their mythology. And sure enough, if you look at other earlier Canaanite texts, such as those recovered from Ugarit, we see that such beings, being somewhat like angels and demons, don't really play that much of a role in their mythology either. Indeed, the ancient Near East generally operates on a different religious paradigm than in later mythologies. Whereas the apocalyptic religious revolution shifted the religious paradigm to a battle of good versus evil, which remains basically the dominant paradigm today, the more ancient and archaic paradigm was a chaos versus order paradigm. This more archaic mythology shows that Baal, Marduk, and Yahweh defeating the forces of chaos, often in the form of terrible sea monsters like Tiamat, Yam, and Leviathan. Indeed, this chaos kampf myth, as it's known to scholars, survives throughout the Hebrew Bible and is perhaps most apparent in the book of Job there, especially toward the end, and in Psalm 74. So one of the major reasons that angels and demons just don't play much of a role in this very early stratum of Israelite mythology is that the central paradigm here just isn't good versus evil. It's order versus chaos, with chaos having been conquered in the primeval past. Now, that's not to say that malevolent supernatural beings aren't present. They just aren't mythologically central like they become later, after the religious revolution of apocalypticism starting in the Persian period. Indeed, in that paradigm, the major drama or religious conflict is moved from the primeval past to the distant future. So what do we know about such demon-like entities in this very early period, say from roughly 1200 or 1000 BCE to roughly around 586 BCE? Typically, we can divide such beings into three groups. There are personifications of malevolent forces, there are hostile members of the divine council, and there's a kind of grab bag of otherwise obscure beings that seem to inhabit the wilderness and wastelands of ancient Israel. Note what's missing here. There really isn't much in the way of chthonic or beings that emerge from the underworld. The reason why has to do with how the ancient Israelites conceived of their underworld or afterlife called Sheol. This realm isn't a place of punishment, but a kind of gloomy, dark place of inaction. While the dead do dwell there, there's no conception of heaven or hell at this period in Israelite history, and thus no 
demons to live or emerge from there. I've actually done a whole episode on the Israelite conception of the afterlife or Sheol. You can click the card above if you want to learn more about it. So let's take each category in turn, first with malevolent personifications. Perhaps the most ancient of these is death itself. Death or Mot was a god quasi-conquered by Baal in Canaanite mythology, and there are some echoes of this personification of death in the Hebrew Bible. Though generally such motifs are muted by Israelite writers, probably in the interest of divorcing their mythology from their neighbors. Further, battering winds are sometimes also personified, and one kind of recalls the western wind demon Pazuzu, which brings drought, and this is also connected to Mot, or death, in Canaanite mythology. Though the central entities here are typically various forms of sickness, including mental illness. We find personifications of fever disease or epidemics generally, typically associated with Reshef or Dever, a survival of a general disease god from Canaanite and eventually New Kingdom Egyptian mythology more generally. In fact, the prophet Habakkuk describes Yahweh going to war and seemingly driving a chariot pulled by Dever and Reshef or pestilence and fever, with Reshef probably coming from the root, which means burning, as in a burning fever. Of course, plague demons are widely attested in the ancient world, and a great deal of ancient medicine, especially ancient Mesopotamian medicine, had to do as much with exorcism as it did with what we would now recognize as medicine as such, such as the use of various kinds of pharmacological drugs. What's worth pointing out here, however, is that such personifications of disease in the Hebrew Bible are almost always under the direct command of Yahweh and not independent beings as such. Mental illness or insanity is also attested, specifically in the case of the first Israelite king, Saul. Here we find a Ruach Ra'ah Mi Yahweh, or an evil spirit from Yahweh, being sent to afflict the king with some kind of mental illness that causes him to fly into rages and fall into despondency, only temporarily soothed by the music of the young David. That this being or evil spirit is sent by the Israelite God is again important, and this leads us to our second category, hostile members of the divine council. The concept of the Divine Council is rather archaic, and it does survive into Israelite mythology despite the eventual emergence of monotheism. This is likely evidenced by the plural let us make in the first Genesis creation story, but also appears especially in places like Psalm 82, which strikes me as a rather archaic Israelite document. The members of the Divine Council have been demoted to non-divine beings in Israelite mythology and are generally dispatched to specific tasks on behalf of Yahweh. Several such beings seem especially interesting for our study. The first is among my favorite stories in the Hebrew Bible. Here we find Yahweh wanting to kill the Israelite king Ahav, or Ahab, who is actually attested outside the Bible. And, in order to do so, a ruse is required to have him killed on the battlefield. To accomplish this, Yahweh inquires of the Divine Council who would be willing to deceive Ahab, or Ahab, and a Ruach, or spirit, volunteers to become a Ruach Sheker, or a deceptive spirit, a lying spirit, who will go into the mouth of Ahab's prophet so as to deliver a false prophecy, which will cause him to go to battle and get killed. Now, despite the true prophecy of Michayahu, the deceptive spirit is successful and Ahab is, well, gut shot with an arrow and bleeds out on the battlefield. Now, why is this one of my favorite stories in the Hebrew Bible? Because it reveals Yahweh capable of being a cunning and deceptive god, which otherwise disrupts so many simplistic and tidy theological accounts of a loving, just, or even kind God. I enjoy this account because it complicates Yahweh in Israelite theology more generally, 
And I think that complicated characters are just more interesting, if not, if not a little terrifying. One might also add an entity sometimes referred to in the Hebrew Bible as the Malacha Mashchit, or the messenger of destruction to this list as well. Also the messenger or angel of the Lord, or angel of Yahweh, this entity seems primarily to have the grim task of mass executions, striking down Israelites, Assyrians, and Egyptians alike. The only description of this entity is a vision had by King David, where we're told of the titanic proportions of this being, such that it was standing between heaven and earth with a sword drawn in its hand extending over all of Jerusalem. Perhaps the most terrifying appearance of the Hamashchit, or the destroyer, is the final of the ten plagues set upon the ancient Egyptians. There the Israelites are warned to smear lamb's blood above their doorposts such that the Mashchit will pass over their homes as it stalks and kills the Egyptian firstborn, from the firstborn of the cattle to the destruction of the god king's son. Of course, this angel isn't truly demonic, well, it probably was from the Egyptian perspective, but this will eventually be transformed into the Malach HaMavet, or the Angel of Death, in later mythological developments. If you want to know more about the history and development of the Angel of Death, make sure to check out my episode on that topic in the card above. Of course, the other member of the Divine Council worth mentioning here is the Satan. Yes, the Satan. This being is always identified with the definite article Ha-Satan, the definite article in Hebrew, and the Satan, which means something like the accuser or the adversary or the obstructor, is a title rather than a name. So Satan as such doesn't appear in the Hebrew Bible. Rather, Ha-Satan is a title of a member of the Divine Council who seems to act as either a kind of prosecuting attorney against human beings, or otherwise obstructs human affairs on the command of Yahweh. This entity is mentioned 18 times in the Hebrew Bible, most famously as the torturer of Job as part of a wager with Yahweh. Yeah, Yahweh lets the Satan torture a dude and kill his family, basically on a bet. I mean, Yahweh does give him some more stuff and another family in the end, but only after basically telling him to shut up after questioning why Yahweh would, you know, let this happen to him in the beginning. And then, of course, Yahweh brags about defeating Leviathan, not that that has anything to do with, you know, Job's dead family. I mean, dead family. I beat up a sea monster one time. I like them apples. Whatever. The Satan also blocks the way of the prophet Balaam, but is never linked with, for instance, the talking serpent in the second Genesis creation story. Nor with the Malach Yahweh, or the angel of the Lord, which, as I mentioned a moment ago, kind of sometimes goes on a rampage and kills a bunch of people for stuff like taking an unauthorized census. Of course, over time, all this more evil-ish stuff will get linked with Hasatan, and in the process by which the Satan becomes just, you know, Satan or the devil, especially in Christian and Islamic mythology. Now, just that process is going to have to be the topic of a future episode, how a title of a being became the devil, but those elements aren't yet present in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, Yahweh and the Satan seem kind of chummy sometimes. And it's clear that at this point in Israelite mythology, the Satan certainly operates on behalf of Yahweh, not despite or opposed to him. A profound difference from the Satan of later Christian and Islamic mythology. The last group of hostile divine council members are also somehow tied to the beings described in Genesis as the Nephilim, or literally the Fallen Ones. These beings seem to have been members of the divine council who come to earth to mate with human women, thus producing a race of giants that is kinda wiped out a few chapters later in a great flood. I say kind of wiped out because there are other biblical texts that make genealogical connections between these giants and characters like Og of Bashan, the Philistine Goliath, who the Bible can't quite decide who killed him, 
King David propaganda, and the giants are the Anakim seen by the spy sent by Joshua. Of course, the Nephilim get a much bigger backstory in the first book of Enoch, produced during the high period of apocalypticism, but the Hebrew Bible is generally uninterested in them except to explain the presence of later kind of gigantic people. Perhaps the larger mythology around the Nephilim was already understood or otherwise documented and they didn't feel the need to flesh out the idea of the Nephilim, or the Nephilim just weren't that interesting to the composers of these texts, or this was some part of a more esoteric mythology that didn't get much public discussion. It's hard to say and who knows. I think the dearth of information in the Hebrew Bible may also indicate that the later Enoch narrative isn't really a continuation of a more archaic Israelite mythology, and are more likely mythological developments in the Persian period, though it's difficult to say anything with certainty. I'm sure I'll circle back to the Nephilim and their leader, Simyaza, at some point in the future, but what's important here is that their origin in the Divine Council and their only later robustly converted into more demonic entities. Our last category is a kind of demonic grab bag of beings that seem to be supernatural in nature and are typically associated with the wilderness or wastelands more generally. Most of these beings are mentioned only in passing, sometimes only once, and they remain very mysterious. For instance, the Shadim seem to have been associated with human sacrifice, but virtually nothing else is known about them in the Hebrew Bible. It appears that the term was imported from Akkadian, where a Shedu is a lesser to use term for a male version of a Lamasu, or a protective deity, typically taking the form of a winged bull or lion. How exactly a relatively positive being in Mesopotamian mythology becomes malevolent in Israelite mythology isn't quite clear, though demonization of outsider deities or spirits is a pretty common move historically. The shift from I don't worship or even like your gods to your gods are actually evil isn't so difficult to imagine. It's worth mentioning, by the way, that the term shade or shedim in the plural goes on to become the standard Hebrew word for demon. We also have the se'erim, literally the hairy ones, it seems to come from the word for goat, which seem to have inhabited ruins and been the object of sacrifices. They're also associated once in the Hebrew Bible with lilit. This is grammatically a feminine form and may have been possibly a night demoness, though the mention here is only in passing. Lilith, as the rebellious first wife of Adam responsible for crib death, is a much later development made famous in the alphabet of Ben Sirach, a text composed in the period after the Babylonian Talmud. Although I will say that Lamashtu and Lilith are clearly connected and there's a development through time of that entity, we just don't see her specifically in the Hebrew Bible. There are also three mentions of Azazel in the book of Leviticus, though even if this is a being at this point in Israelite mythology is uncertain and I think even unlikely. Az just means goat in Hebrew, but could also mean rugged. This is perhaps a pun referring to the Judean desert where the goat would have been sent as a scapegoat. This term might also just mean something like the goat that is sent away, which is how the term is actually translated in the Septuagint. Though the la, the two, is also curious contrasted with la Yahweh in the same text. Though by the apocalyptic period, Azazel becomes fully demonized and goes on to great fame in Jewish, Christian, and especially in Islamic mythology. It's unlikely, however, that the writer of Leviticus had such a notion in mind, with the demonization process happening many centuries later. Finally, it's possible that a being called the Aluka, which also appears only once in the Hebrew Bible in Mishle or Proverbs, may be a reference to a vampire-like entity. The word is a feminine noun meaning the one that sucks and can be rendered as leech. Though in later Arabic mythology, a very similar term is used for a female vampire-like character, like in the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. 
though it's unclear if that association obtained at this period of Israelite mythology, and with the term only mentioned once in the entire Hebrew Bible, it's, it's pretty tough to draw any kind of firm conclusions about whether this is an early Israelite vampire. Hmm. Generally speaking, that's the range of Israelite demonology as it's preserved in the Hebrew Bible. Of course, eventually non-Israelite gods such as Baal, Molach, Dagon, Chemos, etc., they all get kind of demonized. But note that there's no systematic demonology in the Israelite literature. There's no origin theory for these beings. There's no sense of how they fit into the divine ecology more generally. And they're really not connected with the origin of evil or a negative afterlife. There's no demonic leader or clear organization of these beings, and only in a couple of cases are associated with anything like our modern conception of demonic possession. Also, if you're interested in the history of possession and exorcism in this period of Israelite religious thought, check out my episode on that topic, which goes from ancient Israel all the way into developments in the Kabbalah. As I mentioned earlier, it appears that such malevolent entities played only a very minor role in Israelite mythology, like Canaanite mythology more generally. Of course, that would dramatically change with the rise of apocalyptic Judaism in the Persian period, probably because of intense contact with both Hellenic and Persian cultures. Though I will say that this more archaic Israelite position did persist into the Second Temple period despite the rise of apocalyptic Judaism with a group typically referred to as the Sadducees, who rejected the existence of angels and demons generally, along with the resurrection of the body and the idea of punishment and reward in the afterlife, maintaining a much more traditional Israelite concept of Sheol, in some sense, the Sadducees actually maintain a much more traditional, if one might use that word, traditional worldview of the ancient Israelites. Though with the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, this position seems to have basically gone extinct along with the Sadducees as a group more generally. Angels and demons were here to stay, and I'm sure I'll be exploring those developments in future episodes. If you're interested in the history of angels and demons, magic, or the academic study of topics in occultism, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.